Dreaming of an Italian vacation in Umbria? Well, this is the place, Palazzo Terranova. Now, originally, this was a summer palace. The animals would be stabled on the first floor, and the family would live in the several floors up above. Today, it's an inn. The building was beautifully restored by Sarah and Johnny Townsend. And as you can imagine, they filled it with antiques from all over the world and from the local area. Now, the piece I want you to see is in this room. There are actually several of them. They are small tables called monastery tables. The monks might have sat at them, done their reading or writing, and taken their meals. And look at down here. Years of the monks' sandals resting on this stretcher have worn it away. The legs are nicely turned. The top is mitered at the corners and has a solid field in the middle. I really like the size of this piece, and if you make several of these, you can line them up and make one big, long table. So I think we should take some measurements. Although I wish I had brought my English rule. Although, I know how to convert metric. Well, after converting those metric dimensions to inches, I think I have a fairly accurate reproduction of the antique original we found in Italy. Now, there is one other difference. The antique was built out of chestnut, which still grows and flourishes in Italy. I decided to build ours out of reclaimed southern yellow pine. Now, whenever I make legs for a table, and here I'm going to need eight for this one and the next one, I use a lathe duplicator. Let me show you that. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. I've set up one of the blanks for a leg here in my lathe, and I've put some lines on it because I want to show you one that I've already turned. Two portions remain square, one at the bottom and one at the top. Now, this pine tends to chip very easily. So right along all those intersections, I'm going to take a handsaw and make a slight cut at an angle. Okay, that takes care of that. Now, let me show you how this duplicator works. I started out by making a pattern. Think of it as a cross-section through the leg. It shows every detail of the turning. For instance, it's straight along this section, then there's a bead and a cove, and then we're square again. The way the machine works is that on this end, there's a pin, which is a follower. And as I move it forward, it'll eventually hit the template, while on the other end, there's a chisel, which will actually do all the work. Sort of works like the key-making machine in your local hardware store. And whenever I do turning, I like to wear a full face mask. You never know when this can come flying off, and you don't want it to hit you in the face. Here I'm using a profile sander block to smooth out the details. Boy, this southern yellow pine is amazing. These reclaimed timbers could be over 100 years old, and you can still smell the resin, and there's plenty of pitch in the wood. Now, we got the timber from a friend down in Athens, Georgia. 
and he got it, well, why don't you see for yourself? All right. Well, Jason, you've driven me way out into the countryside here. Where are we? Norm, we'll just, we'll just kind of keep that to ourselves. Okay. <laughs> Now, you salvaged quite a bit of the timber from that big fire. We did. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've got some of it sitting here. Uh, these are some of the end pieces we were able to uh, cut off of some of the ones that have already been sawn, actually. Wow, that's uh, the old heart pine, huh? Yes, it is. Some of these, you can see, it's been burned uh, mm -hmm. during the fire. So, look at the growth rings on this. Look at how close together they yeah, are. Yeah, they're really tight. Uh, some of these will go upwards of 40 grains an inch on some of these. So, so with that much, boy, you're looking at a timber that came out of a tree that could have been two, three hundred years yes, old. Yes, sir, sure did. Oh, there's not a lot of char on it, though. Not a lot at all. We were able to salvage quite a bit of lumber off of this, mm -hmm. even though it was burned. Mm -hmm. Now, also, when you deal with these old timbers, you have to get rid of all the bits of metal and nails that are in it. Right. You can see all the nail holes we've got here, and obviously, we've got two big bolts there, and all that's got to come out before we can saw it. All right, well, once that supply is gone, where do you turn to for the next bunch well, of timbers? Well, that's why we're here. I wanted to show you this old barn we have here. Wow, look at this place. So what's the story on this? This particular barn's owned by an old couple here in the county that uh, we approached about taking it down. Uh, you know, from a safety standpoint, it, it, it really needs to go. And uh, we'll be more than happy to take it down. You're a wonderful person doing these great well, favors for these people, right? <laughs> we try to. It beats burning, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, I can see from a woodworker's point of view that there's a lot of potential for the timber that's in there. Can we take a closer look? Sure. Let's go around. Well, as a woodworker, I'm starting to get excited. Are there many buildings like this around Georgia? Well, Norm, believe it or not, this is one of the last ones of its kind in the state of Georgia. Really? Really. I don't believe you for a second, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this place. It's built out of beams. They must be 5 inches wide, 12 inches high, beautifully joined with these dovetail joints at the corners. One stacked on top of the other. Looking up there, there's some clapboards. It looks like it was sheathed with those at one time. And it's got a tin roof over it. Now, these look to be all hand-hewn. Yes, they are, no. Wow. I can see some furniture projects coming out of these. And you're doing this as a favor for the owner. That's right, Norm. We just don't want to see it get burned. All right. <laughs> can we look inside? Sure. Wow. I'm very surprised. This is pretty refined. I thought this would just be a rustic building, all rough on the inside. Somebody went through a lot of trouble here. These are the timbers stacked up on top of one another. And they took the time to sheathe it with these 1x10s, 1x12s, all the way down to the floor. And they're nice and solid. They're in good shape. And look at this one, just sitting on the ground. Nice, tight growth rings. Some more of that hard pine, and nice and flat. Do you realize what you have here? Well, I, uh, no, I really don't. Could uh, you tell me? Jason, lion's going to hurt you. And look at the ceiling joist. They've been beaded on the corners. I wouldn't have expected that at all in a building like this. What do you suppose they used it for? As a guess, I'd say it was a one-room cabin. Uh, we've got an opening for a fireplace here. Uh, hmm. Well, it's a great old building, and there's a lot of really good timber in here. I can see a lot of furniture projects coming out of this, or flooring, or whatever. Why don't you take it down? What's next? Let me show you. Jason, I thought you said the last place we were at was the last building. There's another candidate. Well, Norm, uh, there's two, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, what happens here? Well, Norm, this is Larry Fitzgerald. How you doing? Hi, Larry. Uh, he's Hi, our milling guy. We, uh, we bring him a real sawn stock. This is some one by stock that uh, was sawn on a portable bandsaw mill. So it's about an inch thick. You don't have to dry it because it's not a green tree, but it's very irregular. Right, right. So you take it through the process. Show me right. your machines. Right. No, we start with the, uh, the we got a 30 inch planer here, we start off with the milling process. Wow, that's a good size planer, that'll handle just about anything. Right, right. And then after the planer, uh, would they come out surface like this on two sides. Now look at these boards, they must be over 20 feet long and over 12 inches wide. Right, right. Beautiful stuff. Now what's this going to become, furniture? It's going to be flooring. 
So you make it into flanks. You have to make a tongue and groove joint. Right, right. I see you got a couple pieces over here. One has the groove. You straighten the edge, made the groove. And then on the other edge, you have the tongue. Right. Once that's done, it's ready to ship out to the job. Right. Then the floor finishers, they come in and do their sanding and, and uh, finishing with polyurethane or oil or whatever. The one process is they can take it and they can buff it out with a, with a paste wax or some, kind of, a, some mm -hmm. kind of a wax and give it a good shine. Yeah, look at the wood. The grain comes right through. It's beautiful stuff. And when people see it, everyone wants it. Mm -hmm. Is there enough of this stuff to go around, Jason? I think so, Norm. We've, uh, we've got one more stop to make. All right. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. All right, now we're talking. A little fishing. What do you suppose we got in there? Probably got a few catfish, a few brim there, Norm, but uh, we're in Porterdale, Georgia for a little different fishing expedition here behind you. We've got an old mill building that uh, on the outside is brick and glass, but uh, in the interior, we've got a little treasure in there. I bet it's some more of that heart pine. Could be. Let's take a look. Well, what did they produce in this old mill, Jason? Well, Norm, in this particular mill, they produced rope and twine products out of cotton. And what happened to it? Well, actually, uh, in the early 70s, uh, due to competition from the synthetic fiber industry and uh, foreign competition, this particular mill had to close. Put down. Well, there sure is a good amount of timber in here. Is this the same yellow pine we've been looking at it all is. day? It is. This is the heart pine we've been seeing. Okay, so tell me, how do I get some of this up to the New Yankee workshop so I can build a project? Well, Norm, do you really like it? Oh, I love this stuff. Well, uh, there's a few feet left, so uh, maybe we just need to talk about it. A few feet? <laughs> a few thousand feet? Maybe a couple. Well, Jason sent me some beautiful timber. Look at this piece. Tight, tight grain in a nice quarter sawn pattern. It's nice to know that this ancient timber is going to have a second life in a piece of furniture. Now let's take another look at the prototype. The legs are joined at the top with a small rail, and at the bottom there's a stretcher between the legs and another stretcher that joins the sides. All the joinery is mortise and tenon. I've laid out the mortises on the leg. I'll make those at my mortising machine. I've set my dedicated mortiser up with a half inch chisel with the bit that comes down through the center. The bit removes most of the material and the chisel will square it up. I've set the fence so that it's a half inch from the back edge of the chisel and I've set the depth for a little over an inch. The mortise for the stretcher is horizontal on the leg rather than vertical. What I'll do is make one plunge on this edge, one on this edge, then I'll move the fence and clean out the middle. The short stretchers get this mortise, which will receive the tenons from the stretcher that goes end to end. We noticed on the antique original that the square portions of the leg were rounded over all the corners, either by being scuffed from years and years of rubbing by sandals, or maybe it was part of the woodworker's job when he built it. In any case, I want to try to replicate that detail, so I'm using a block plane to knock the corners off, and I'm also using this little tool, which is pretty handy. It's a little micro plane, and I can shave bits of material off the corner, sort of a free-form shape. And after I get done shaping it, I'll just sand it, and I think we get the effect I want. Here I've got organized the various rails and stretchers. Two long rails, two short rails, the long stretcher and the short ones. I've set up to make some of the shoulder cuts. I have a stop block set an inch from the outside of the blade 
and I have the blade height at a quarter inch. On the rails, I want to go all the way around. On the stretchers, I just want to make the cuts on the narrow side. Here, I'm elevating the height of the saw blade to 7 sixteenths of an inch to make the remaining shoulder cuts on the stretchers. Here, I'm beginning the cheek cuts on my tenons, and I'm using my tenoning jig. It's really the safest way to make this cut. It holds these narrow pieces securely as I push them through the saw. Let's take another look at the prototype. The top is secured to the base with some wooden clips, and they fit into a groove that's cut in the rails. That's next. Let's take another look at the prototype. The next detail I want to make is this chamfer. It stops about an inch from the leg on the rails, and on the stretchers, it stops an inch from any intersection. And I'll make the chamfers with my handheld router. Finally, some assembly. Some glue in the mortises and on the tenons. I'm going to slip this top rail in first on the short side of the table. Then the stretcher. And we'll clamp it all up. With the two end assemblies complete, I've now put glue in the mortises for this long stretcher and for these long rails. We'll put all these pieces together and then clamp it up the long way. Okay. Well, that's it for today. Tomorrow, we'll make the top and start putting on some finish. Well, good morning. I removed the clamps from the base, and I'm doing just a bit of touch-up sanding before I start working on the top, which is the next item. Let's take another look at the prototype. I made the top look just like the antique original, a three-inch band around the perimeter, mitered at the corners with a field of boards in the middle. Now, I have to be careful how I actually build this top. If I glue these short pieces to the field, it's like a breadboard edge, and it can't move. So if it shrinks, I could get cracks, and if it expands, I could get splits at the corner. Now, what I'm going to do is do it the way the antique original was, which was to allow the field to float. So in the long dimension, I'm going to make grooves and put in splines, dry, no glue. In the short dimension, I'll have a tongue and groove joint, again, no glue. And I carefully selected some very good boards with vertical grain so that I will get less expansion and contraction. First thing I want to do is make the grooves. For the last few minutes, I've been very carefully cutting the ends of the boards for the field. I want them to be absolutely square, even though they might come and go a bit with changes in humidity. And that looks pretty good. I've also taken the time to set up and run one of the tenons on the end to make sure that that fits properly. Those will go right into the short pieces. And you'll notice there's a slight gap in the end. And that's OK. I want room for expansion. The setup for the tenon is a sacrificial wood strip and the dado cutter. I guide the piece through using my miter gauge, making sure it stays tight up against the fence. OK, that's going to be good. Now I want to carefully miter all the corners of the band. I'm hoping that these miter joints are going to stay nice and tight, but to ensure some strength, I'm cutting slots to add some biscuits. Now it's time to cut some splines. I've selected some stock, 
so that the width of the spline and the grain run in the same direction. If I were to cut the splines across the grain, they just split. Okay, now I can start to slip the splines into place in between each board and also with the perimeter pieces. Then I'm going to clamp it together. There's no glue. We don't want any glue in this part of the job. Once I have it clamped together, I'll check the alignment of my miters, and then I will glue the biscuits in place. Glue in the slot for the biscuit, and on the joint, we'll slip both ends on and clamp it up. While the top cooks, let's make some clips to secure it to the base. It's a very simple clip that fits into the groove that I made in the rails, and a screw comes through the hole to secure the top. All I have to do is use my miter gauge and a saw blade to remove material to make this little tongue, and then I'll cut it to length at the miter box. I'm easing the corners using a portion of a quarter inch radius roundover bit. To secure the top to the base, I just slide the clips into the groove and drive some inch and five eight screws. So once that's attached, I guess I better start thinking about what kind of finish we're going to put on this piece. One of the challenges in trying to finish this project is to unify the colors of the wood. Some of it's a bit yellow and some of it's a bit red. So we pulled out our stain collection and we're turning to this gel stain. And the manufacturer says to apply it with a brush, let it sit for five or ten minutes, and then wipe off the excess. So this leg over here see when I start to wipe it off, I'm getting sort of a nice brownish color. And I think we may have to apply a couple coats to the more yellow wood to unify the colors. Well, here's our monastery table with a couple coats of polyurethane on it to protect the surface. Now it's ready for your favorite monastery, your favorite restaurant, or the favorite room in your house. It was a nice project to build. Mm -hmm.